they should have um, values in school because um, it teaches kids how to be nice to people and how to act friendly um, with other people. So they they're not. It's not like always people fighting and arguing about stuff. We we want everybody to learn the values so they can understand what good behaviour is. Yeah, definitely, because you don't want people to be upset because like you don't want to fall out with your best friend and then not have your best friend again. I'd say that you should have values education. It will, it will teach everybody, even the teachers, to be show their values and you don't you don't know when you're going to have to use them and when, if the children, when they grow up and move up to high school, they will have that learning that they had so they can use those values when they get older. Hello and I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Julie Rees and I'm a head teacher at a large primary school in Herefordshire and that's called Ledbury Primary School. It's a school that I love. It's a values based school. And I've been head teacher there now for 14 years. And I've had the privilege of working with Neil and the team on values based education during my time at Ledbury. And today I'm going to talk to you about the first pillar of values based education. And that's how we model the values for our children, for our students, and for the community around us. And how do we model the values towards each other? It's the first pillar. The way I'm going to explain to you how I have learned to use modelling within values-based education is through using this wheel. And there's going to be four special elements that we look, on, look at that I'm going to connect to with you today just to give you some ideas of how modelling can look within values-based education. So the first area I want to talk to you about is passion. And within passion, I think about how we enable people to flourish. For me, that is so important that everybody in life has an opportunity to explore the skills and the strengths that they can offer the world. And that people actually enjoy what they're doing because I have this feeling that if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then you won't flourish. And if you don't flourish, you won't find happiness. So let's have a look at what passion connects us to. I chose this picture because I think when we use the word passion, people automatically think about the fire and the love and perhaps the extrovertness of the word passion. But for me, passion means more than that. Passion means a connectedness to something that you feel really strongly about, something that you want to celebrate. Passion for me is following your dreams and making sure that it happens. So how did I find my passion for becoming a teacher? Well, way back in the 1980s, when I was studying to be a teacher, a significant event happened. It happened on this date, January the 28th, 1986. I don't know if any of you are fantastic at recalling historical dates, but on this date, a tragedy happened in our world. There was a space shuttle called Challenger and it left its station with these people on it. Astronauts who were so excited to go into space. And then, 73 seconds into the flight, tragically, Challenger disappeared. It exploded along with those astronauts. And one of those astronauts happened to be a lady called Krista McAuliffe. She was a teacher. She was the first teacher to go into space. And her passion was to bring back all of her learning 
and influence children for the future, to give their dreams. She said the world is small, but space offers so many more opportunities. One of the things that she said resonated with me at the time. She said, I am a teacher. I touch the future. I teach. And this really sat so well with me as I wanted to know what sort of teacher am I going to be? My passion was making a difference in every single child's life. Every single child that's come into my classroom or my school, I've wanted to nurture them. I've wanted to teach them. I've wanted them to have a passion to learn and desire and go forward and make a difference to the world. And to this day, this quote still sits on my office wall. I touch the future. I teach. Mark Twain said, if you turn your vocation into your vacation, you will never work another day in your life. And quite honestly, that's how I have felt. Don't get me wrong, there have been many, many challenges along the way. Challenges as a classroom teacher, and then as a deputy, and latterly as a head teacher. But I have never woken up and thought, I don't want to go to school today. Going to school puts a smile in my heart and a love in my heart. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful vocation. And I'm just wondering how that comes across in other professions, in other jobs. So I started reading about other people that I saw as being passionate people. And one of those people was Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. Sadly, Steve Jobs is no longer with us. But here in this clip, he talks about the passion for his job and goes on to talk about building team within that passion. Please just take a moment to watch this clip. And now, as I'm coming towards the end of my headship, I think about how I can continue my passion. And I've always known that I'm interested in people. I've always known I wanted people to flourish around me. And I think of people like this spiral you can see, like ferns that are curled up tightly at the beginning of the air. And then nature starts pricking each of the fronds and each of the fronds opens up beautifully. But as with people, some of those fronds do just keep a little bit closed because perhaps that frond hasn't been stimulated. That area has not been explored. Some people keep some of those fronds tightly shut because maybe they're scared or nervous or do not want to explore that area of their life. My passion now is about getting everybody to flourish as a fern in the forest. I want forests and forests full of ferns where people are opened up, looking to the light, living peacefully and in harmony together where there's new life and new growth. So you've heard about my passions, my passion as a teacher, as a head teacher. You've heard of somebody else who was passionate about their job, Steve Jobs. But what about you? What do you love in your job? What are you most passionate about? Just take some time now to either talk to somebody about your passions, communicate that feeling really clearly. Or maybe you want to take some time to write a poem or do a drawing to reflect your passions. The next 
aspect I want to talk to you about through modelling is role models. In this area, I'm thinking about people who, in the, our past, people who we can relate to as we grew up, people in history maybe from the past. Then those people in our present, whether that be people who are famous in the world or whether it's somebody local within our community or our schools. And also the influencers, the people who have really made a difference because they have fought passionately for what they believe in and have changed the way society thinks and made us really reflect on our values. So role models from my past. Here you can see a picture of my large extended family. I'm very fortunate to have grown up in a big family. It was a matriarchal family. Uh, we had strong women in our family. Women who were really determined to get on with life, but determined to ensure that love absolutely flowed throughout our family. Being the first grandchild, there was a lot of expectation on me and a lot of feeling that I would do well in life. But I wanted to. I wanted to please my aunts and my uncles and my relatives. But the one person I wanted to please more than anybody was my dad, sat there in the middle. That's my dad, Clive. He has been an absolute inspiration to me all his life. He once played football for Youth England back in the 60s and he loves reminiscing the stories of that time. But because he was a footballer and I was interested in sport, I tended to tag along to a lot of his games. And I observed very quickly that if you wanted to get on in life, you learned how to listen to other people. He was a great listener genuinely interested in everybody that he meets. He wants to ask them questions. He's inquisitive, he's curious. He shows excellent deep listening skills. And I'm fortunate to have my dad still in my life. And I love him very, very much. And he's still a great role model for me. In my present world currently, here are some of the role models that I think, wow, you just show the values that I would like my children to replicate. So in the top right there, we have Jacinda Harden, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. And throughout this coronavirus period that we've been in recently, she has shown such compassion and understanding for herself, her family and her country, truly putting everybody at the heart of her decisions and making the right decisions. You also have a picture on here of Mary. Mary was a pupil at my primary school and she went on to high school and then has gone on to play football for Wales. And here she is revisiting our school and presenting one of her caps from Wales to two pupils from the school. And Mary comes often to talk to the children about the values that they need to show in order to make them determined to succeed. Determined to succeed is our mission statement at Ledbury. And Mary always says that the values that she learned were rooted from that time at Ledbury Primary School. And also here in the present is one of my wonderful teachers, Jacob. Jacob is a fantastic teacher. And I just want to tell you a little bit about his interview because when he came to interview, he did the most wonderful lesson, maths lesson, that I've ever seen. He was sparky, the learning was great, the children moved on. They came out of that lesson absolutely buzzing about maths. And then during the interview, Jacob was answering the questions. And one of those questions was, well, what are your strengths? And he said, well, I'm very tall, so it means if there's anything on a tall cupboard, I can reach it. And then we said, OK, so what areas would you like to develop? And Jacob opened up about the fact that he has cerebral palsy and he has struggled with that in aspects of his life. But it's never been a barrier to him. He has overcome any barriers that could have been there 
and he is an absolutely outstanding teacher and a valued member of the Lebri community, a true inspiration. And then we have our influencers, Mother Teresa. I remember many stories about Mother Teresa when I was growing up and her life being dedicated to the poor of Calcutta. Amazing woman. We have Stephen Hawking, someone else who has the, had the most amazing brain. Mathematically, scientifically, nothing was a barrier for him. And despite his physical disabilities, he overcame them to be one of the greatest scientists we ever had. And then we have the Obamas. The Obamas have made us think differently about politics in our world, have shown that we can have values and compassion within politics, that we can make a difference to a nation. Many people could have been on this slide. And I wonder which influences you would choose to talk to your children about. So, just a moment now to reflect on role models and how we can use them within values-based education. Think about those people in your past, the values that you have admired in them, the values that you want to rep uh, reciprocate now in your life. And which people in our present, in our world now, are influencing you in the choices that they're making, in the way that they're speaking, the changes they make, and what about the influencers, the people who've really changed our world for it to be a better place? What values do you notice that these people share? And how can these values shape you as a role model going forward? The next section is about communication. And there is no doubt about it. When children see how you're, behave, how you're behaving, whether that be at home or in school in the, or in the community, children will copy that behaviour. We say children see, children do. I am currently so excited because we have a tiny baby within our family. And the connectedness between her and her mother is just mind-blowing. The love and the warmth and the role modelling that is taking place, the gurgles and the laughs and the copying of the mouth with the beautiful oohs and ahs, you can just see that from day one, it is so important that parents understand the influence that they can have on their children's lives. But this film from the Australian government is very interesting, it's profoundly moving. I'd just like you to take a moment to watch it and see what influence adults can have on the children around them. It's quite frightening, isn't it? We have so much influence over our children. And here's another great role model I wanted to share with you from my school. This is Svetlana. And every year Svetlana organises the Race for Life at Lebri Primary School. And she does it with such passion. She wanted to make a difference. She wanted to raise the money. And she's come to me with all of her ideas. The parents are invited, the children run around the field and just look at the love and the pride that she has shown the children from her non-verbal gestures, the smile on the face, the connectedness with the children. And all of those children simply wanted to be part of that big hug she is about to give fantastic communication. This quote here from Heim Gino is from 1972. And it's a quote that I encourage teachers to have written somewhere within their classroom. It is a quote that has stayed with me throughout my training and without my career. I'm going to read it to you now. I've come to a frightening conclusion that I'm the decisive element in the classroom. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. 
As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humour, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanised or dehumanised. It really does bring it home how powerful a teacher's presence is with the children, the students that are in front of them. And I remember very clearly being in my own primary school when a teacher shouted at me so badly that I was so upset. I disgraced myself on that day. I was nervous, I was shaking, and I lost the use of my bladder at eight years old. And I stood there with a puddle of wet water at my feet, ashamed of what happened. And I'll never forget how cruel that teacher was on that occasion. And times like that stick with children. I equally remember the teacher who in year four, when I was at primary school, read Charlie in the Chocolate Factory to us at the end of every day. And I can remember the space I sat on, the carpet, listening to his tones, his Welsh lilt, and how he played the voices of all the characters with a twinkle in his eye. We have a lot of responsibilities as teachers. I do not want to be a tool of torture. I want every teacher to be an instrument of inspiration. And because of this, and because of the story I've just shared with you about my own personal life, in both of the schools where I've been ahead, I've only made one rule, the rule, in the school. I wonder if you can guess what it is. In fact, there's no surprise really. No shouting. Nobody ever raises their voice above my level, which is this. In modelling the values that we want our children to follow, by losing our temper, by being cross and shouting and being angry and directing that anger at the children is giving them the wrong message. Please don't get me wrong, emotions need to be spoken about at school. This last year I lost my trusted and beautiful deputy head teacher and we had an outpouring of grief and emotions in our school for a long, long time. It was a sudden death and it was such a shock for our school community. And now we've had coronavirus this year. That's a lot for schools to contend with over two years. And we talk about our emotions, whether we're feeling sad or happy, anxious, we talk about being angry too, but we talk about it, we communicate, we don't shout. Which leads me to staff well-being. And particularly as the head teacher, I know that if I don't model good well-being, how can I expect my staff to look after themselves? So through our modelling, we ask the question every single time. What is the purpose of what we're doing? Consequently, we're always revising and making changes because we put children at the heart of what we do. Every decision we make, we say, what is the purpose of this and how is it going to improve the well-being of staff and children in our school? So little things like now we give verbal feedback to the children within the classrooms, which saves my staff having to mark 30 books every single night, or even 60 books if they're marking two subjects. The impact has been incredible. In fact, since we've been doing this, we've had the best outcomes for the children in our school. 
because we are engaging, because we are communicating. The other aspect of staff well-being is to make sure that staff can see that I take breaks, that the leaders take breaks, that we actually cherish each other. We have a wonderful staff room. We role model the highest expectations for the environment so that staff feel comfortable coming to school, that they want to be there, that they're happy. The impact? Of course, staff sickness levels drop. People are happy within their jobs. That word passion comes through again. So in terms of communication and how you communicate in your school, do celebrate your communication strengths. Look at this list in the black box and celebrate what you're doing really well. Continue doing that. But is there anything you need to stop doing? Do you allow shouting in your school? Have you had a discussion about that? And looking at the list, how many times is there true deep listening going on where people stop and aren't multitasking and they're given space and opportunity to really tune in to what the other people are saying to them? How's media communication handled in your school? When are emails sent? How long are they? What's the response times that are expected? Are staff expected to respond on holidays and over the weekends? Have a conversation about it. Have an open conversation about it. And finally, within this pillar, of modelling, I want to talk about the importance of stories and assemblies. So stories are the way we understand and make sense of the world we find ourselves in. Stories started way back in time, even before we could speak, we know that stories were communicated non-verbally, through pictures, and how lucky we are to have inherited so many amazing stories about the world and how it's grown. How often in your school are stories told about people of the past, people of the present, the influences? How diverse and inclusive are the stories that you share? How many times are stories looked at from a different angle, maybe? Perhaps the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf was not so bad. What if we looked at him through the eyes of what happened? Perhaps Little Red Riding Hood had a few issues with him in the first place. Get the children absolutely immersed in stories, but get them immersed in stories of their locality as well. Where have they come from? What's happened in the past? in where they live, in their community. Get local people in to tell their stories. I'm really conscious that we're going to be losing so many people now who were alive during the Second World War. And I love listening to the stories of my elders about what life was like as they came out of the war, the rations, the 60s with all the, the wonderful dancing that they did, and the fun that they had and the music and the Beatles through into the 70s. Wow, fascinating. We need to capture these stories. We need to share these stories. And there are many, many stories out there which talk about values and virtues. But let's look for the real stories too, from real people. And a great place to tell these stories is in assemblies. We love our assemblies at my school. I just want to tell you a little bit about how we set up the ethos of assembly because assemblies do build the community. On a Monday, I will go and sit quietly in my chair and on the chair is a beautiful throw dedicated to Jill, my deputy who was tragically killed. And that gives me a moment to reconnect with her and it makes me smile. And I light a candle and we play some soft music. And then, as the music plays, the children come in very quietly 
That's just the expectation. The staff are modelling what the expectation is from the reception children who may be just four years old, some of them up to year six, who are 11. And in that room, there could be 460 children sitting and just being and enjoying the space, peace and quiet all around them. And then I may bring in a story, never told from a book, always told from the heart, sometimes using pupils, sometimes using adults, sometimes using a video, and sometimes just a quiet story told simply, but always connected to whatever the value might be for that month. I love that time. It's a special time with my staff and my children. The staff come into assembly, they sit around the sides and you can just see them easily relax and get engaged with the ethos, being the role models. If a child has a little nudge or a wink or a chat by, with the person next to them, nobody's reprimanded. It's just the expectation that that child will be quiet once again. It's always interesting when we have new children join the school. And the reason I put this picture up here, I'm not bossy, I have skills, leadership skills, understand. So many times I've been into an assembly where in, an, in perhaps another school where um, the expectation is that the children will be quiet, but the staff are quite happy to have a chat about their weekends or what happened the night before. In order to establish a wonderful community and this ethos and assembly, it needs the adults to model it for the children. It needs to be calm. It's unique and special when you get there. It's quite a hard work at first to get it going. But once you get there, it is a eureka moment. And it's a moment that I absolutely adore every week when I take whole school assembly. So stories and assembly. How connected are you to your own story? And what is it about your choices that show you have modelling your values through those stories? Focus on introducing themes around values and diversity in your stories and assemblies. Can you find local storytellers to come and tell you their own stories to the, the school community? And learn to tell stories out loud without reading from a book. And the last bullet point I've put here reminds me of a young lady that joined us from Russia. Beautiful, beautiful girl. And she joined us in year five with no English at all. But she loved to tell stories. She loved to tell stories in Russian. And one Christmas, I was telling the story of Babushka in English. And she offered to tell it in Russian. And she came to the front of the whole school assembly with a lot of children and adults in front of her. And she wasn't phased. And through using her gestures and through using her voice and her eye contact, she told the most amazing story non-verbal communication and the sound of her voice and you could hear a pin drop in that room as she connected to that story. Use those opportunities. So finally, when we put all that together, I feel that that gives children and students and adults a sense of belonging and being a part of their community being great role models for what they want the future to be, what they want the children of the future to grow up like. And for me, if I could choose one of the values that I want to model for our children, it's to be kind. I would like children to have that sense of belonging and being a part of this magnificent world that we are all on that we share. I want them to have a sense that they belong locally in their communities but they also belong to the wider world and space and beyond and the choices that they make, how they are, their being in the world makes a positive difference. But this starts with kindness 
And some of the role models that I've talked about today, in fact, all of the role models I've spoken about today, that's the one value that they all show, in my opinion, and that's being kind. Thank you for listening. I hope this has given you an insight into our first pillar, modelling. Thank you.